The reading for today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, beginning with the first verse. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to the pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. The message of our Lord. Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What time is it? N.T. Wright, the Anglican bishop and prolific Bible scholar, identifies this question, what time is it? is one of the most important questions to ask in order to understand any biblical text or the larger story arc of the Bible. So what time is it? What was happening when this prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 23, which we just heard read, originated? Jeremiah chapter 23 is based on events that occurred sometime after, but not too far after, 600 B.C. Maybe Jehoiakim, but more likely Zedekiah, the last king of Jerusalem, is on the throne. It's a chaotic time as the kingdom of Judah is coming to an end and about to be conquered by Babylon. King Josiah, a religious reformer and one of the few good kings, is killed in a battle with Egypt in about 609 B.C. His son Jehoaz becomes king, but he's captured and imprisoned by the Egyptians, and Judah becomes a vassal state of Egypt. Now, there won't be a quiz on this, but I'm giving you the names here on this slide of the last five kings of Jerusalem, just so you can follow this chronology a little bit better. And I do promise there won't be an essay or a quiz later. So, King Josiah dies, his son Jehoahaz becomes king, but he gets, he gets captured by the Egyptians. And the Egyptians then install Jehoiakim, another son of the good king, Josiah, as king of Jerusalem. Then Babylon invades Judah, and Judah becomes a vassal, a vassal of Babylon until they rebel. King Jehoiakim briefly takes the throne after the death of Jehoiakim. This is confusing, but that's why I'm giving you those names. He briefly takes the throne, and then he surrenders to Babylon, which was attacking again in something like 598 or 597 B.C. He and his family and other governmental officials, together with the king's soldiers and what the Bible describes as skilled craftsmen, are taken away to Babylon as slaves. And then Babylon installs Zedekiah, Jehoiakim's uncle, as king, with the understanding that he will be loyal and pay tribute to Babylon. Got all that? Did, we just really need to catch the story arc, what's going on here, right? Jerusalem gets conquered a lot because they're not good at staying conquered. They also aren't all that good at defending themselves against larger military forces. Zedekiah rebels against Babylon. So Babylon attacks and conquers Jerusalem, destroying the temple in the process. And they take the rest of Jerusalem's elite, including the wealthy, the royal family, and the people who worked for them, as well as the priests, into captivity or slavery in Babylon. 
2 Kings chapter 23 and 24 describes all of these men as bad kings saying he did evil in the sight of the Lord, which is code for not worshiping or encouraging the worship of the true God, among other things. 2 Kings describes Jehoiakim as particularly evil and brutal, saying that he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord was not willing to forgive. Now, Pastor Bob just read to us from Jeremiah chapter 23. If we had started a chapter earlier at chapter 22, we would have heard these kings, these kings Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim described in contrast to the good king Josiah as having taken advantage of the poor and needy, the alien, the orphan, and the widow, and having shed innocent blood and declaring that none of their offspring will sit on David's throne or rule anymore in Judah. Which gets us to where we can actually now talk about what happened or what we heard from chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 begins with, Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. That sounds scary, doesn't it? Especially if you're a shepherd. Of course, references to shepherds were metaphors for kings. This is one of the most common images for kingship in the ancient Near East. Similar imagery appears in Ezekiel 34, and of course in the, in the famous 23rd Psalm we read, The Lord is my shepherd. Kings, like shepherds, were expected to watch over their flock, protect them, keep them together and in order, and make sure that anyone who was hurt or weak was taken care of. And that is exactly what these kings of Judah had failed to do. Jehoiakim may have been the foremost example as he failed by perpetrating injustice, economic oppression, and violence. The Lord goes on after saying, Woe to the shepherds. He says, It is you who have scattered my flock. The judgment is coming from the Lord who is using human history to punish those who by their misrule, their injustice, their failure, have scattered the flock and are causing Israel to go into exile. And the Lord will attend to those who did not attend to the flock. Judgment is coming, and Jeremiah says it will not be pretty. And it certainly wasn't as Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem, conquered the city, destroyed the temple, and took the people into exile. Many of the leaders of the army or the temple were executed. Now, we might miss because we think that Christianity, we think that Christianity shouldn't be political. We may miss how political this passage is. The leaders those charged with caring for the people had failed to do so. They didn't care for the poor and needy, and the Lord made sure they paid for it. But the fact that it's political in the context of 500-something B.C. doesn't make it easy for us to apply today as members of both major political parties are simply likely to blame the leaders of the other party for whatever failures we have or whatever failures we perceive we had. And this passage doesn't lay out any particular program that would have solved the problem. It is only pointing out that the kings and their bureaucracies, the government of Jerusalem, didn't care for the poor but oppressed them instead. Chad Bird, a Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor and well-known Old Testament scholar, points out that most national histories are about how great the nation is, tooting your own horn, if you will. But the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, which functions as the history of, 
of Israel during this time is largely about how the people of Israel and the nation of Israel failed. It's a history of failure. And this passage might also remind us that while we often think of prophecy as foretelling the future, prophecy is really largely about listening to God's word applied to what's going on in history. Moses and Joshua had given the people warnings recorded in the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua stating that they wouldn't be able to keep the commandments. They wouldn't stay true to the Lord. They wouldn't follow the Lord's command and they'd pay for it. And Moses and Joshua were right. Those failures described by the prophets as failure to worship only the true God and failure to care for the poor eventually brought about the fall of Jerusalem. No matter how bleak things seem, though, God hasn't given up on God's people. While it is you, the kings, who have scattered my flock, Jeremiah writes, I, for my part, am going to gather my flock and bring them back into the fold. The shepherd imagery continues both in the depiction of the Lord's shepherding of the people and in the announcement that the Lord will raise up new shepherds who will truly be for the people. So the prophecy contained words of judgment, but also contained words of hope. The hope becomes more specific in verses 5 and 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will, ra who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. God will raise up a righteous branch for David. The Lord declares an intention to place a different descendant of David on the throne. It is not all over. Yes, the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple are real, and there's a way in which they are a real end. But there will be a new beginning. The reign of the new ruler, the new king, the new shepherd will be characterized by righteousness, which will be manifested in God's relationship with God's people. The new king will do justice and righteousness and provide safety for the people. Doing justice and righteousness was the job of the king, which Israel's and Judah's kings had mostly failed to do. This failure was the central the central sin of Jehoiakim. It led to his downfall, and perhaps as the straw that broke the camel's back, it led to the downfall of the entire Davidic line of kings. But God promises a future king to be called the Lord our righteous Savior, or perhaps it translated differently, the Lord is our righteousness. This messianic text predicting a future in which God brings the people back and provides them with a just king, a just ruler, was picked up by later prophets, including, for example, Zechariah. And this passage was one of the Old Testament texts that led first century Jews to look for a Messiah, God's anointed one, perhaps a political or religious leader, to rescue them from the Roman Empire. Which brings us to the New Testament. This is the third message in a series called The Cradle That Holds the Christ Child. Now, we did take a brief detour last week as Pastor Bob brought us a message focusing on our congregation's recent trip to Uganda. But we're back on this series again. And in this series, we're looking at connections between the Old and the New Testaments, we're looking at how all Scripture can point us to Jesus, how Jesus fulfills the law of the Old Testament, 
and particularly how the New Testament writers reinterpret the Old Testament through a lens that understands that Jesus is the promised Messiah, God's anointed one come to save God's people. There are a few New Testament passages that you might have thought of while listening to this passage from Jeremiah being read. One of those passages is from Luke chapter 1, recording the prophecy of Zechariah the priest after the birth of his son, John the baptizer. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his child David. As he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Zechariah is rejoicing that God has raised up a mighty Savior, that God has brought salvation. God is fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy of a righteous branch with the birth of Jesus. In Jesus, God is fulfilling the Old Testament promises made to Abraham, to David, and to the people of Israel. The hope of which God spoke in Jeremiah is being fulfilled. Well, the people of Israel were hoping for deliverance from domination by foreign powers. Instead, God's deliverance Sending Jesus to be our Savior would result in changing the circumstances for all of humanity. Jesus would bring God's righteousness and justice, setting people free and creating the possibility for a new exodus that creates the opportunity for us, the opportunity for us to have a redeemed new relationship with God and each other as God had always intended. This also allows us unhindered worship and service to God and God's kingdom here on this earth. As another example, in John chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In contrast, to the evil shepherds described in Jeremiah 23 or Ezekiel 34 forever, in which, Ezekiel 34, for example, in which the kings were also accused of endangering and exploiting their sheep. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the good shepherd, cares for his flock. Jesus is even willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of the sheep, for our sake rather than seeking his own benefit or advantage. In this passage, Jesus is drawing on images from Jeremiah and Ezekiel, in which God is described as a good shepherd, the model or true shepherd, who cares for the sheep and rescues them from the places to which they have been scattered, feeding them and tending to the weak, the injured, and the lost. Jesus fulfills God's promises from the Old Testament, doing God's work and rescuing not just the people of Israel, but rescuing all of humanity and giving his own life for our sake. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament promises of a good shepherd. And Jesus seeks a relationship with all of humanity, all of humankind, in which he, the good shepherd, knows his sheep, and we know him and recognize his voice. Jesus gave himself for us, for you, on a cross. He did this to save us, to save you from everything that separates us from God and he rose to conquer sin, death, and the devil. When we come to have faith in Jesus, to have a relationship with him in which we spend time in prayer, scripture, worship, and service, learning to hear his voice.
He calls us to work for God's kingdom and to work for God's values of justice and righteousness. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the good shepherd. Help us to know him, to know his voice, and to follow, and to work for your values of justice and righteousness here on this earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.